Today we're talking about this new lens from Tamron. This is the 35 to 150 millimeter f2 to f2.8. As usual, disclosure wise, this video is not sponsored by Tamron. They don't get any say in this video. They didn't give me any money to make this video. But this video does have a sponsor though, and that's Storyblocks. Also, have you guys heard of Dustin Abbott? He is another YouTuber that makes videos like this. In fact, he already made a video on this lens and I happened to watch it. And the guy's making great in-depth videos. So if you haven't checked out his channel or if you haven't checked it out in a while, go check him out, especially with this lens as a good starting point because I'm not gonna cover everything that he already covered because I wanna encourage you to go check out his video because they're great. Now he focused a bit more on the photographic side of things. I think that's what he tends to do. So I'm gonna try to fill in some of those gaps with video and I can also you know, validate some of the tests that I've done that he did as well. But seriously, great creator, go check out his videos. Okay, quick overview of the build quality. It's, it's good, it, it feels solid and rugged. It's really well weather sealed. And this is unlike those other Tamrons, the, the zooms they had before, 20 to 75, that kind of thing. This feels dense and heavy. Kind of reminds me of like a Sigma lens, like, you know, the big heavy Sigma lenses. The zoom direction though is the opposite of the Sigma lenses. It has an external zoom, by the way. I was asked about that on Twitter. But it goes sort of clockwise to zoom just like the Sony native lenses, unlike the Sigma lens, which is the opposite. So if you have Sony and Tamron, you won't be backwards all the time. Where Lindsay over here on the zoom is using a Sigma 24 to 70 and it zooms the opposite way. And in a minute, I'm gonna switch lenses with her to use this lens. And I think you might find that it might screw up because the <laughs> zooms go the opposite way. Anyway, it's a small difference, but I noticed it as a, as a video shooter. It's 1165 grams, so about two and a half pounds, which puts it a little bit heavier than the new 70 to 200 from Sony F2.8 Mark II, but lighter than their original 70 to 200 F2.8 and the front filter thread is 82 millimeters. Now regarding the variable aperture, at 35 millimeters, it's an F2, but then as you zoom through to 85 millimeters, it stops down to F2.8 with you know separate stops in between there. And then it stays at F2.8 all the way up to 150. But when it comes to the minimum aperture, at 150, you can stop all the way down to F22, but then at about 95 millimeters, you can only stop down to F20, at 70 millimeters, about F18, and then by the time you hit about 45 millimeters, it's an F16 until 35 millimeters. Now both the zoom ring, which has a lock, which I like, and the focus ring are well dampened, they're nice to turn and they're very smooth. And the focus ring, as you can see from these two pieces of tape that I have on here, has quite a long throw. Uh, if you look at one and then look at where the other one is, it's about 180 degrees around the lens, which you don't normally get that long of a throw on sort of a hybrid photo lens. And it's pretty linear, I found through. It might be perfectly linear. It's hard because I don't really have a perfectly scientific test for this, but what I did is I focused on something close, put a piece of tape on it, and then focused on something quite far and put another piece of tape on it. And then I went fast and slow and tried a whole bunch of different ways to mess it up with a non-linear focus. If you go fast and slow, it has acceleration that will throw off your focus. But this one, every time I landed on a piece of tape, no matter how I moved it, it was in focus at the two points. So I think the focus is really linear. And it doesn't have hard stops, so consider that. But despite that, it was easy to repeat focus and I found the manual focusing experience excellent on this lens. I also found it quite decently parfocal, which I was surprised by considering, you know, the focal range and, and the maximum aperture. But whether I focused at 35 millimeters and then zoomed all the way to 150 or focused at 150, pulled out to 85, it seemed to maintain focus on even the smallest details doing that. So I think at least my copy of the lens seems to be pretty, pretty well parfocal which is great. Now in Dustin's video, he covered the photo autofocus quite extensively. Again, go watch his video. And I agree that in my experience anyway, for a single shot, it focused pretty much instantly. It's using Tamron's best linear autofocus motor and it performs well. Dustin surmised that maybe it's not the best lens for you know high action sports and that you should probably use a dedicated lens for that, maybe like Sony's new 7200. But the versatility here can probably get the job done and it's a viable choice. Now I would say on the video side of things, that I have confirmed similar results to what Dustin found, but in photo, which is that it does the job most of the time in most scenarios, and especially in that sort of middling range where if you have a subject that's not super close, you know, it, it'll track them really well. The only time I found that it sort of fell apart is when I ran at the camera really quick and I got right in that close focusing range. It took an extra second for it to focus, where something like the 7200 from Sony, the new one, didn't really suffer like that. So again, only the extreme situations does this fall short but in most, I would say, normal pulls and normal operation, it does the job really well. And now to demonstrate this, as well as some of the other features I'm excited to share with you, I'm gonna throw it on camera number two, which I have an idea in mind to actually use this as the second angle zoom lens. I think it might be perfect for a job like that. 
Right now on that camera, as I mentioned, we're using a 24 to 70. This is it at 24 millimeters, and then all the way zoomed in at 70 mil looks like this. So you get an idea of you know how tight we can get. But now we're gonna switch it, see what that focal length looks like, see how the autofocus performs, and talk a bit about focus breathing. Okay, so the Tamron is on there now. This is 35 mil though, so we're tighter than we were at 24, but we can reach further. So I think we can actually back the camera up. Let's do that now. So this is it at 35 mil, and then I guess you just wanna slowly pull it into 150. So I don't really have anything here to show. Here's my teleprompter remote. So we can get probably much tighter than we could. Oh, you're still going. Oh, that's pretty good. Look at that. Pull it all the way back out rapidly. Crash, woo! Okay. So yeah, that's pretty versatile for that angle. And when it comes to noise, Lindsay's now a little further away with her noisy Ninja 5 recorder. So we get a little further away from the shot too, so that's good. Okay. Now something I wanted to talk about was focus breathing, which I think is excellent on this lens. Okay, so we switched the lens over to manual focus now, and keep an eye on this C stand here, as uh, we, Lindsay, if you can pull focus all the way to one extreme, we're looking for breathing here, and then come all the way back to the other extreme. Now we'll do the same thing, but 150 mil, and we're gonna look at this light here, so rack focus all the way to one extent, and then all the way back to the other, Perfect. So as you can see, I think the focus breathing control on this lens is excellent. I feel like in Dustin's video, he actually undersold it a little bit. He said, you know, that it was good, but not great. Maybe there's a little bit of sample variance. I, I don't think, I, I hope not, but my version is excellent when it comes to focus breathing. That's all I can say. I was really pleased with it, especially compared to the G Masters that I've been reviewing lately. Okay, now let's do a couple autofocus tests on the fly because I think this is gonna be a really good practical usage case scenario for this lens, this, you know, sort of off to the side zoom lens thing. I think it's great for that. So first of all, I think we're doing eye tracking right now. And is it tracking me okay? And then now let's do some touch tracking for rack focuses. So I'll put this here. So if you can tap on that and then tap on the drill behind me. And then I'll say now, I guess, so that the viewers know when we're doing it. So tap on this now and tap on the drill now. And then tap on this now and the drill now. So those look, and then cancel tracking. And it's back to my eye, right? So as you can see, they're fast, they're smooth. You can adjust that obviously if you want to. I have it on the default, I think four, five, four slash five setting on the A1, but they're consistent and they're fast. The only time you're gonna come to an issue, like I said, is if you get really, really close to the lens. And speaking of that close focusing, I would say that's one of the major weaknesses, if you wanna call it that, of this lens. It's not what the lens is for, but it doesn't do that, which is that it doesn't have a very great reproduction ratio in terms of like macro close focusing. What is interesting though, is that it's very consistent throughout the zoom range, which I appreciate because that's a convenient feature. But on the wide end, I think it's a one to 5.7 and on the tele end, like a one to 5.9. So very similar, but that's not gonna get you anywhere near any kind of macro reproduction, which for me, even though at 35 millimeter, like if you think of it as like a fast 35 millimeter, 35 F2, that's great. But if I buy a fast 35 millimeter, like the 35 1.4 G Master, you can get really close and get these really interesting, smooth, out of focus, you know, tiny world detail shots that you can't really do with this lens. It's not really built for that. So if that's something you like to do, then you need to augment it with another lens, or if that's all you like to do, this isn't the lens for you. So it is a weakness. Just be aware of that, that whether you're at 35 or 150, you're not gonna get anything too macro-y. But what is cool about it is that as you zoom, you can kind of zoom and get closer, and your magnification stays about the same. The only thing that changes is how physically close the lens will focus. So it creates actually really smooth, interesting, you know, I'm used to having a lens in my hand when I talk about this stuff, it's weird having it over here. Anyway, you get the idea. Not not too macro, but uh, but consistent in the reproduction ratio. And speaking of not always being able to get the shot you want, what a perfect time to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Storyblocks. Like I said, sometimes you don't have the shot you need and there's no way you're gonna be able to go out and get it before you run out of time, run out of money, or run out of patience by completely derailing your creative momentum. And that's where Storyblocks comes in. They've got subscriptions for every budget that give you access to a vast royalty-free library with unlimited downloads, allowing you to use the footage worry-free for both personal and commercial projects. They're also focused on enriching their catalog with diverse and inclusive content to provide useful assets to creators with varying needs and audiences. And this is all easily accessed using their intuitive interface with filters for 4K video at multiple frame rates, along with backgrounds and After Effects templates. 
If you've never browsed Storyblocks before, I think you'll be truly impressed by just how exhaustive their library is, and I encourage you to learn more about them by using the link in the description below. Now regarding image quality, this is something that Dustin really covered well. If you want to analyze the corner sharpness of different apertures and focal lengths, he's got you completely covered. What I can say though is that I agree with his assessment. Both the wide end and the telephoto end are very sharp with only a minor dip in the middle focal range. To be honest, this is one area where I was expecting the lens to falter. I figured it was too broad of a focal range and too wide of apertures to keep consistent sharpness, but I was wrong. It does exceptionally well. And that sharpness is bolstered by excellent chromatic aberration performance. I also wasn't expecting to see almost no longitudinal fringing, but I'm happy to report that it's tremendously well controlled in this lens. Bokeh, when analyzed closely, isn't the best I've seen. Definitely not G Master quality. There's some onion ringing, and the fact that this is only a nine bladed diaphragm shows you can see some of the polygonal edging where the blades meet. But it's also not terrible or worth complaining about too much, and in practical situations, it swirls together nicely, in my opinion. The same is true for flare. This lens doesn't have the best flare control compared to super premium lenses, but the way the flare does wash across the scene is actually pretty pleasant. There's the odd ghosting artifact that I'd suggest putting the included hood on to help eliminate, but the contrast reduction is smooth and has artistic merit. I wasn't afraid of shooting into the sun on this lens. And the rest of the time, the edges are sharp, the contrast is good, and the colors are rich. No complaints. Overall, this is a surprisingly impressive lens. I was never a huge fan of those other Tamron zooms for Sony E. While they offered a decent value, I found they had major shortcomings and they felt cheaply made. This lens is the exact opposite. Sure, it's large and heavy, but what do you expect? What's more important is that it covers a massive, useful zoom range with terrific control over important factors like focus breathing, chromatic aberration, and manual focusing. And the image quality is way better and much more pleasing than it has any right to be considering its versatility. Honestly, this might be one of the best hybrid lenses I've ever used. There's the odd ghosting artifact. Oh, why'd you double take it? There's the odd ghosting artifact that I... Now you delayed again. There's the odd ghosting artifact that I suggest put... There's the odd ghosting artifact that I suggest putting... I didn't get the line right. You did right, that's good. You did a good job.